Turn in our Bibles this morning to the book of Isaiah, chapter 66, please. We are taking a break in our Finding Jesus series, and today we want to look at a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture on this Mother's Day 2013 that speaks in promise of the comfort of God. And amazingly, God here in this passage is going to talk about the comfort that He offers, and He uses the illustration of a mother to make the point. Now, I do not want to take it for granted today that everyone here knows what it means to be comforted. Because when most people hear the word comfort today, they might think of comfort zones, comfort ends, and comfort food. And we like the comfort food part especially, right? But I am not sure that we understand what it means to really be comforted anymore. It seems like the art of comforting is a lost art in our society. To bring comfort to someone means to be sorry, to be moved, to pity, to have compassion, and then because of that, to console, to soothe, to relieve somebody, to help them in their time of need because of your feelings in your heart. It is action that is based off of the heart to help someone who is hurting. Now, it's a wonderful thing that there is a promise like Isaiah 66, 12 and 13 in the Bible. Because we as men and women, as the book of Job says, Job chapter 5, are born unto trouble as the sparks will fly upward. There, ever since the beginning, when man was expelled from the Garden of Eden, there has been trials, there has been struggles, there have been pains, there have been temptations, there have been failures. And my friends, without the comfort of God, life is just plain miserable. It's going to be very blunt. It is miserable today. Because if you are trying to go through these things alone, if you are trying to cope rather than have freedom in them, it binds you up, it holds you down, it weighs on your conscience and your very soul with no relief at all. And people live this way and it's like they can't even breathe. They might breathe oxygen, but they can hardly breathe life. Do you know what that means? Without comfort. Now... If you are in one of those situations today, there's a word of hope for you today from Isaiah 66. If you feel like things are going well today and you don't need any comfort, do not despise the promise of God here. Do not ignore it or think this message is not for you. You might not need it now, but you will require it one day because the calm never lasts forever. There is always a storm of brewing, is there not? And you need the comfort, you need to be ready, and you need this promise that God gives us as a mother comfort. So if you'll look with me at Isaiah 66, we're going to read together verses 12 and 13, and I pray this will help you today. I pray if you're struggling, this is going to help you a lot. Look at what God's Word says and we will pray. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, And the glory of the Gentiles will be like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed, on her sides shall you be carried. You will be dandled on her knees, bounced on her knees. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. And you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Let us pray. Father. Today, I pray our hearts would be still, that we would be real with you, real with ourselves. God, for the struggles, for the trials, for the pain, for the temptation that is real today. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you would just wake us up to the comfort you offer. And Lord, we would see the importance of your heart, the love of your heart, your arm reaching out. And God, that we would be changed and we would embrace you. And Lord, that we would find this freedom. We will give you praise as you work today, because you are good, God, because you are the God of all grace and comfort. And we pray this in Jesus' most wonderful name, and God's children said, This promise begins, Thus saith the Lord. Wonderful promise of God. God is speaking to you today. This is a word from God for His people. And I love how God teaches us. He often is very straightforward in the language of the Bible. Just straight, literal. He's in your face telling you exactly how it is. But there are times when God wants us to understand something because it's so important 
And when he does this, he uses figures of speech. He uses metaphors. It's like the parables in the Bible. He tells a story to help us to see how important something is. He uses something that's common that you can relate to so you will get who he is and what he is saying to you. And that's exactly what he does here. He says, I am going to extend peace to you. Now, the word extend is really important before we get into these metaphors, into these pictures that God gives us. The word extend means to stretch out, to spread out, to expand. It's used in the book of Genesis talking about a tent, a big tent that's being set up and it's being spread out. It's used in the book of Isaiah chapter 40 to talk about the stars in the sky, in the heavens, how they are spread out, how they are extended above. And everywhere you look, When it's dark out, you can see a star everywhere you go. And I think the point here that God is making when He says, I'm going to extend these things to you, is that He is a generous God. That when He works, He shows it, you see it, you feel it, it is everywhere around you. You need to understand that God enjoys giving. He loves multiplication. Look in the Bible at the miracles of Jesus. Miracles of giving. Miracles of multiplication. I mean, just in the small things of creation, we see the generosity of God. Yesterday, I was cutting up a tomato to put on top of a pizza that we were going to have for lunch. As I was cutting that up and thinking on this passage of God's extending grace, His generous grace that He gives out, I was thinking about the seeds in the tomato that I did not try to count because there were so many of them. And what is amazing is in every seed in that tomato, there was power to multiply, to reproduce a plant. And each plant could then reproduce what? More tomatoes. I mean, just in the fabric of creation, God is generous in these very small things. And He loves to multiply. He loves to extend. So if you give God your energy, He will multiply it and strengthen you. If you give God your time, He will multiply it and make you be able to stretch farther than you've ever went before. If you give God your money, your stewardship, He multiplies it. If you give Him your talent, He multiplies. I love what James says, James 1.17, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, of whom there is no variation nor shadow due to change. So every good thing that God has given, it is His will for it to be extended, for it to have growth. I want to tell you today that God did not create you to be stagnant. God did not create you just to be comfortable in life. He created you for His extending grace. He created you to do something in your life, to give you something. I love what Ecclesiastes 5 says. It says, Everyone to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them is to accept His lot and rejoice because this is the very gift of God. He is the giver. He is the extender of all things. Now, that is the foundation for the promises we see today. He says, I am going to extend to you peace. Now, this is the Hebrew word that you probably all know. Even if you've never taken a Hebrew class, it is the word shalom. It is a word that denotes all kinds of gifts of God. Future happiness of people is shalom. It's the word that you use as a greeting to say hello. It has this idea of total peace, of security, of order, of health, of safety, of harmony, of happiness, of holiness, of wholeness, of completeness. In our sin, we are not at peace with God. In our sin, we are selfish. We are isolated. We are on our own. And then God shows up in our life and He begins to extend things. And we see His generosity just swelling over in our lives. My friends, Jesus Christ came to make peace with humanity. He came to bring shalom to us, to make us whole. Ephesians 2 tells us, at the cross, Jesus came. He preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those of you who are near to Him. He came to bring this very Word. Now, God could just say, I came to bring peace. And most of us would hear that and it would go in one ear out the other. But God is a very good teacher. He wants us to learn. So He uses figures to help us to understand how He is going to bring this peace, the shalom, how He is going to comfort you. And this is where the message really begins. He says here, I'm going to bring peace to her like a river. Now, if you don't believe me that a river is peaceful at times, 
I can tell you that we have a big group of retired men that disappear every week to the river. Did you know that? We live in Pensacola, and they go to L.A. every week almost. Lower Alabama, if you're wondering what that meant. I mean, they are at the river all the time because it's a peaceful place. It's a tranquil place. You see, the idea here is that when a river is peaceful and it is flowing and it is abundant, There is growth. There is fertility. There is uninterrupted plenty everywhere around you. And and here's the point. He's saying when Jesus comes into your life, when God comes into your life, He will begin to extend your life like never before. It will be like a gentle, powerful river that is never disturbed. And all of a sudden, the gospel will bring with it this peace that is so good for your soul. It will make you fruitful. As a river goes through land, it will bring peace peace on you and prosperity inside of you. Now, I can imagine that the author here is thinking of maybe the Euphrates River or the Nile River. I don't know if you've ever looked at Egypt from a space shot, but it's pretty cool. If you look at Egypt from a space shot, basically Egypt is nothing but brown. It's sand. It's dead. There's only one straight line of green through Egypt. And there's, there's some green at the top of the country. Do you know where the green's at? The Nile River. That's the only spot where there's green on the map. It's an amazing thing to see. I encourage you to go look it up if you have the internet. And my friends, you've got to understand today that the glory of God, God's extending grace in your life, it will be like a river to you. And it's not just to the Jewish people who Isaiah was talking to. You notice what he says. It is also the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. It will be... Constant. It will be inexhaustible in your life. His peace will be different than the world. When the world tries to bring peace, well, let's just look at how the politicians bring peace amongst one another. That lasts for a long. It has a lot of continuity, doesn't it? Look at peace treaties that are signed behind, between countries that shoot at each other the next day, right? I mean, there's not a lot of continuity and peace. But when you're talking about the peace of God, God is an inexhaustible fountain. And so his peace differs from the world, which quickly passes away and dries up. His river is large. It is spreading, never drying up, bringing blessings with it wherever it goes. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 7, he said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Do you want peace? Do you want the extended hand of God working in you? You need Jesus. He's the one who will come and bring it. He's going to bring it to Jerusalem one day. And every time someone receives Jesus, he brings this to their life. As he was standing out on the Sea of Galilee and the storm was raging and he spoke and he calmed the storm. He does that in people's lives today. It's wonderful. But now that's not really the metaphor that I want to focus on today, amazingly. That's a great metaphor. But then he continues with a new metaphor. And he begins to talk about the care of a mother and how God cares like a mother cares. So he says, then you will feed in this verse. On her sides you shall be carried. You will be dandled. You will be bounced on her knees. So let's say that there's some people here who are new Christians. And you're like, I've believed in Jesus. I've been saved. I've followed the Lord in baptism. Now what? Now what happens in my life? Well, now God is with you. Now everything has changed. And the first thing that needs to happen is you need to eat. The first thing that needs to happen is you need to grow in the faith. You need to feed. And he says here this very thing, as a child is nursed by the mother. The idea is the tenderest care God will exercise over you as a mother would over her little child. 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us like newborn children, we are to long for spiritual milk, that by it we would grow in our salvation. And you know, I I read this poetic imagery of a nursing, a mother nursing her baby. And you cannot help but think that that little baby finds satisfaction, joy, nourishment, all in the arms of its mother as it's being fed. And let me tell you, if you're not getting anything from God and from His Word, you're not being fed, you just don't know how great it really is. I mean, the Bible is alive. It's a living book. He wants to speak to you. He wants to speak into your life. He wants to extend into your life with His Word. And it will come true in your life if you are His child. Now, secondly, 
It says, on her side, you will be carried. Another image of a mother. You know, whenever we go to the mall, it never fails. We've got a six-year-old and now three-year-old. And the little one always gets tired when we're walking. We don't go to the mall a whole lot. But when we go, the little one gets tired. And guess who picks her up? Mom does. And mom will carry her for about 20 minutes. And then dad starts to feel convicted because he's being lazy and doesn't want to hold the little girl. So I want to help my wife out, so I grab the little one and I start carrying her. And then about two minutes later, I say, guess what? It's time for you to walk on your own. Men and women are engineered a little differently, aren't we? You know, a mother loves to hold this child in her arms and on her side. And I think of Jesus. He is the great shepherd who picks up the lambs and he holds them and he carries them. It's like that wonderful story in Luke 15. What man of you, if you have a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, you will not leave the other ninety and nine and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he finds it, he will lay it on his shoulders rejoicing. I mean, God just picks us up. So you start to grow in your faith if you're a Christian. And then God begins to carry you. He's going he's gonna to help you to get legs of your own. And He's going to take you and hold you through the hard times as well as the good times. He will be by your side. And then it continues. You'll be dandled on her knees. You'll be bounced upon her knees. You know, I love to see children bounced on knees. I've taken Brother Bill visiting with me a few times. And if there's a baby in the house... Brother Bill Amen is going to get the baby. I just want to tell you that. As uh, grumpy as he said he was this morning, yelling at those little guys who were trying to sneak in front of the moms at the breakfast, I want to tell you, he loves kids. I love to see him get the kids on his knee and he's bouncing them. And I love it more when they scream at him and they cry when he's holding them because it's like this great humbling factor. Because he's good with kids, he really is. He's got a gift, but I love to see him cry. The other day, I mean, he was just having a blast. He stole one of our couple's kids, Kevin and Bethany's, and he's bouncing Isaac, and everything's great, and he walks into the foyer, and the baby starts crying. It's wonderful. Is that all right, Brother Billy? You're not going to leave the church, are you? Now, here's what I want you to understand. When a mom gets that baby on her knees and starts bouncing, there's something different there, isn't there? I don't know, but there's just something different. It's something that God's done. We're ugly and mom's not, I guess. That's probably the part of the problem. But a mother affectionately loves her child tenderly with this regard that is unreal. And she'll just do it for hours on end and never think anything of it, right? And us guys, we're just not so gifted. And then this continues on in verse 13. And here's this, this motherly comfort just really made so clear and so wonderful because it's exactly what God does with His people. He says, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. As one whom his mother comforts, so I'm going to comfort you. So you're a Christian, you begin to grow and you get close to God. And he's holding you and he's helping you and he's teaching you. And then all of a sudden we start to have challenges in life. And you know what happens to a lot of people? We begin to go to the wrong things for comfort. I mean, what do people go to for comfort in this world? I say that the biggest thing we go to are self-sabotaging habits. And we think we're going to get comfort from self-sabotaging habits to find hope, to find peace. And let me tell you, a self-sabotaging habit is any behavior that creates more problems than it solves. And we go to these things thinking it's going to make everything all right. People go to food for comfort. That's why we call it comfort food, right? That's one of those unpreached about sins in Baptist churches. The food addict says, I eat because I'm unhappy. I'm unhappy because I despise myself. I despise myself because I'm overweight. And it's a cycle, right? And they keep going back to food because food brings a temporary comfort. People go to overindulgence, not just in food, for comfort. They go shopping. And they spend, and they spend, and they spend until the credit card is maxed out twice. Right? Trying to get comfort. People go to alcohol. And they overindulge to the point that they have lost control. Why? Thinking it's going to get rid of the struggles. People go to couch potato lifestyles to find comfort. And they will sit on the sofa all day glued to the TV. And somehow that's going to take away the reality of life. People have impulsive, rash acts, negative, hypercritical thinking of others. They just they, they go around and they down everybody else thinking it's going to build them up. But you know what? All it does is make them miserable and guilty inside. 
But they do that thinking if they can tear everyone else down, that's going to make them better, right? It bothers me when I see people tear others down. Get a life, right? Get a life and look in the mirror. But we do that thinking it's going to make us feel better. And we walk around hypercritical. We do these impulsive, rash acts. We just make decisions on the spur of the moment, thinking everything will be better. And yet, it seems never to go that way. Even Christians, often, we go to the wrong place for comfort. You see, we think, well, if I just get a part of the ordinances of the church, the sacraments of the church, I'll have comfort, I'll have baptism, I'll take the Lord's table, everything will be better with me. So we show up for those things. We go to worship and church attendance only when we're feeling bad, hoping we'll get some sort of a little high from it, and then we can leave and everything will be better in life. We do acts of love. We see someone in need and we help them. And we think we're going to get comfort from them. You would imagine how many people, I believe, have me on speed dial because they think the minister can give them comfort. I want to tell you something. All those things, Christians, they might be means of comfort, but they are not the givers of comfort. Look, people can use church thinking they're going to get comfort from church, and it's fleeting and it's failing. God is the sole efficient cause of comfort. That's what I want you to see here. He says, I will comfort you. He doesn't say, I'm going to send an angel to comfort you. I'm going to send a pastor. I'm going to send a deacon. I'm going to send things to comfort you. No, there is only one hand, the pierced hand, who can heal the wound that is inside of you and bring you comfort. I will comfort you, he says. And I will do it as one whom his mother comforts. Here, God himself is picturing himself as a comforting mother, speaking with supreme tenderness and love and compassion. No one can bring a comfort to somebody else like a mother can. Isaiah 49 says it this way, Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. He uses the highest illustration he can think of. You know, I'll tell you what. You can talk about somebody else's kids, but don't talk about mama's children, right? Wow. I have seen some moms just about take everyone off the face of the earth because someone spoke the truth about their children. I didn't touch step on anyone's toes, did I? Moms are defensive of their kids. This is a good thing. Now, there's a right kind of defensiveness, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but I want you to understand something. God is lifting up women here. He's lifting up motherhood here. He's saying, this is an illustration of the kind of comfort that I demonstrate. I mean, He is the God of comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, wonderful passage about comfort. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who will comfort us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in affliction, as we are comforted by God. I mean, God is a comforter. He does this thing. But He chooses the mother to be the illustration. Now, I like what Charles Spurgeon said when he was preaching on this passage well over a hundred years ago. He said, A father can comfort, but I think he is not much at home as work. But when God speaks about His pity, He compares Himself to the Father. Listen to this. Like I say, Father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. But when he speaks about comfort, he selects the mother. When I have seen the little ones sick, I have felt all the pity in the world for them. But I did not know how to set to work to comfort them. But a mother knows by instinct how to do it. Dads, we are awkward at this often, aren't we? We care, we pity, we don't know how to put it into action. We, we are stern, we are rough, our hardness by nature shines out, and then the mother comes to the rescue and does it perfectly. I mean, you'll find it amazing how often I get convicted in my office when I'm counseling families and couples, and I hear this wife or this mom crying out for affection and attention, and the guy is like, I do care, but I just don't know how to deal with it. I don't know how to handle it. And then I'm like, oh, that's me too, because I'm a guy, and that's how we're engineered. We're not very good at that sometimes. Is that true, ladies? Just not good at it. We've got to work at that, but that's the facts of the matter. And yet, God is telling us here the tenderness of a mom is so different. 
because she enters into her child's grief. She holds the child close. She tries to take all the child's sorrow into her own heart. She sympathizes like nobody else can. Kindness, affection, tenderness rolled into one. Uh, Yesterday we had a little accident at our house. We've got this new little baby puppy. And it is about eight weeks old. It's a chihuahua. It weighs less than a pound. And um, it's a new member of the home. And we made the mistake of letting one of the kids carry the puppy to the cage. Unfortunately, the the little puppy got loose out of the hand and fell head first and hit the ground. And immediately, guess who said, it's it, it's over, the dog's dead. Me. And my wife is heartbroken for this little dog. Now, this isn't our kids. This is just a dog right now, okay? But my wife is heartbroken over this dog, and immediately she picks it up, and it, I mean, it's out cold. And I, I should have laid hands on it. I should have laid hands on it and prayed for God to revive it. But at the minute, I was just being a dumb man. Do I have to confess? I'm not going to confess at all. You would enjoy it way too much. Just enjoy that much knowledge. I was angry. I was upset. I was furious. The kids got punished. They got sent to their rooms like it was their fault. If I hadn't been lazy and picked the dog up myself, it wouldn't have happened, right? And then after I tell the kids how wrong they were in fooling with the dog and dropping it on its head, then I'm saying to my wife, you know, as she's trying to bring the thing back to life and reviving and petting it and slowly its eyes are open, I'm yelling at my wife about this dog that we need to just go take it and get it put down if it comes back because it's done for. That's a stupid guy for you. And the whole time she's just affectionately petting the thing. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. This isn't one of our kids. It's just a dog. Praise God it wasn't one of our kids. I would have slept with the dogs. So, finally the dog comes to, I guess God made this little chihuahua a lot tougher than I was expecting. And um, puts it on the ground and it wobbles a little bit and then it starts to walk and it starts running and being a puppy again and it comes back to life. But I mean, it was out. I thought it was done. And I, was, I already had it euthanized. I mean, I had the dog dead and my wife still has hope and is comforting it. And then I'm like, all right, well, leave the dog in the house. We've got to go to a graduation party. I take off with one of the kids. When my wife shows up at the graduation party, guess what's in her arms? The dog. I'm like, why'd you bring the dog to the party? Because mom's care, right? That was just the dog. If it was one of her baby, she wouldn't have been at the party, right? That's how mothers are. They have tenderness. They have comfort. That was just for the dog, but that's how you women, you've been gifted that way. And we are not good at it, and that's why God chooses the metaphor of a woman. So I want to end on this note. I want to give you just a couple points that show us how as a mother comforts, God will comfort you. God will help you. Here we go. Number one, the tenderness of a mother's comfort. When a dad typically administers maybe some medicine to a child who's sick, uh, we pour it in the cup and say, there's the cup if you'd like to drink it. The mother comes, sips out of the cup herself to show the child it's going to be okay, brings the child to her, has the child sit on her lap, puts it to the child's mouth, helps it drink it down, tells the kid all kinds of lies about how good the medicine's going to taste, and then just consoles and comforts and encourages. She doesn't talk at arm's length like a man does. She talks with her heart. And that's the secret of her power. And my friends, when God comforts like a mother, He does not rescue us at arm's length. He does not talk to us at a distance. He runs to us. He grabs us. He rescues us with tenderness and compassion. And He does this to us troubled, sick sinners every single time. He doesn't push us away. He pulls us too. He goes overboard. He did it all to rescue us. The personal tennis of a mother's comfort is important, but the feelings of a mother's comfort. To soothe the headache, a mom doesn't just give a kid Tylenol, throw it at him and say, there you go, take it. No, she has to lay her cool hand upon the, the brow of the head like 18 times, right? Like the temperature might have changed the last six or seven times, but she keeps doing it on that throbbing little head. She thinks about the pain and she has all this compassion, right? And then all of a sudden... Um, The other child comes in, and they fell, and they're bleeding. And what does the mom do? It's like her eyes are bleeding as she sees the child. I mean, she just, she immediately goes into this mode. And this is exactly what God has done for us. Because our Lord in human flesh 
came and He identifies with us. He hungered like us. He thirsted like us. He suffered like us. Yet all without sin. And it is only His righteous life that will save us today. Look, we are going to fall into pain. We are going to be sick. We are going to hurt. We are going to lose our peace and joy. We are going to be down and out. And we will cry out as David did. And we will weep bitterly as Peter. And God isn't going to push us away at a distance. God feels your pain. That's why Jesus came. He lived the life and suffered everything you would ever suffer. And He did it all without sin. And He brings you to Himself. And all of a sudden, He puts His righteousness on you. And He makes you right. And He forgives you. I like what Spurgeon said, the refiner is never very far from the mouth of the furnace when his gold is in the fire. You are his gold. He is near you when you are in the furnace. And He is there to help you every single time as a mom does. My friends, number three, I want you to see today the perseverance of a mother's comfort. We have all heard of a mother who wants to teach her child something. And and dads are like, after the third time, that's it. You're done. And mom, like 19 times later, she's still telling them the same thing over and over again. And you ask her, why did you have to say that 20 times? And she said, because 19 times didn't do. She's persevering, right? And I want to tell you something. The perseverance of a mother's comfort is like God's perseverance. Look, we're not the ones who persevere in our faith. God is the one who keeps us persevering in our faith. The Lord is not slack, 2 Peter 3, nine, concerning His promise, as some people count slackness or slowness, but He is patient towards you, not willing that any of you would perish, but that you would come to repentance. I mean, God is patient with us, isn't He? And He keeps dealing with us and dealing with us. And it's not that our faith is so great, it's the faith of Christ. He's given us His great. And He's the one who keeps us. And then I want you to see the wisdom of a mother's comfort, because here's a really important point. A mother comforts her children seasonably. A good mother is not always comforting her child unless she's a fool. She will bring up her child so delicately that it will be spoiled and selfish if all you do is just comfort as a mother, right? She does it seasonably. If she's a wise mother, she saves her comfort till it's needed. When her child is sick, she gives the medicine. When her child is crying, she wipes the tears. When the child has done wrong and all of a sudden stomps their foot and the lip curls and that that proud arm goes in the air and the, the frown is on the brow, the wise mother does not comfort her child at that moment. Instead, when the child realizes they've done wrong, that's when the mother comes and prays with the child to be forgiven. And she says, go and sin no more. It is forgotten. And she is all over that child, building it back up. The broken spirit. And my friends, it is the same with God. God does not come for us in our pride, but when we are humble, He lifts us up and He takes care of us and He looks on our affliction and He will not fail us. And then you think, lastly, the dependability of a mother's comfort. I mean, I could give you so many illustrations of all these points, but think about Daniel. Daniel is in the lion's den. And I don't think Daniel ever had a sweeter night's rest than using some lion for a pillow. And the reason why is because who was with him? God was with him, comforting him. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The master didn't break the furnace walls down to take them out. Instead, he went into the fire with them and cheered them in the midst of the flames. No matter where you're at, the comfort of God will be there. The the comfort of God will overwhelm you when you need Him most. I love what Billy Sunday said when he was preaching. He said, I don't believe there's enough devils in hell to pull a boy out of the arms of a godly mother. And it's the same way with God. There are not enough enemies to take a child of God from our Lord. I recently came across a true story that happened during the Holocaust of the Second World War. And I want to close with this. Solomon Rosenberg and his wife, their two sons, were arrested. Together with Rosenberg's mother and father, charged for the crime of being Jews. They were placed in a Nazi concentration camp, a labor camp, and the rules there were very simple. As long as you can do your work, you are permitted to live. You're permitted to live. When you become too weak to do your work, you will be exterminated. Rosenberg watched as his father and his mother were marched off to their deaths. He knew the next would be his youngest son, David, who had always been very frail as a child. 
Every evening, Rosenberg came back into the barracks after each day of hard labor and searched for the faces of his family. And when he found them, he would huddle them together and they would embrace one another and thank God for another day of life. One day, Rosenberg came and he didn't see those familiar faces. He finally found his oldest son, Joshua, in a quarter, huddled, weeping and praying. He said, Josh, tell me it's not true. Joshua turned and said, it is true, Dad. David was not strong enough to do his work, so they came for him. But where is your mother, said Rosenberg. Oh, Dad, he said. When they came for David, he was afraid and he started to cry. So Mom said, there is nothing to be afraid of, David. And she took his hand and went with him. What an illustration of a mother's love. A love so strong, it chooses to give up life so her child can be comforted. And my friends, that is the exact picture of the sacrificial comfort and love of Jesus Christ, is it not? What does he say in Isaiah 43? Now says the Lord who created you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flame will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Fear not, for I am with you. Jesus took it all so you could be comforted. And this wonderful promise ends, and it says, You will be comforted in Jerusalem. God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. He will wipe them away, and you will not sorrow anymore. John 16, Jesus says, I will see you again. Your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Look, if you don't know the comfort of God, you can know it through the gift of salvation, through Jesus Christ. It is God who gives this comfort, and He will change your broken heart forever. Let us pray. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist, and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.